A damageless run is without a doubt the hardest challenge you can conceive without modifying the game altogether. It's a testament to strategy, skill, patience, and even sometimes luck. Building and crafting the perfect team to take on any obstacle the game may send your way takes diligence and is a rigorous task. That's all well and good, but if I'm being brutally honest with you, I just hate seeing my Pokemon get hurt. So I'm going to complete the game without taking damage. Let's give it a go. The challenge officially commences after the catching tutorial, and I'll explain why in just a minute. The only rule of this challenge is that under any circumstances, we can never take damage. If our Pokemon takes even a whiff of it, we must reset back to the last checkpoint. Checkpoints are scattered and only come in the form of gym badges. Once a badge is obtained, we have the right to save. And because I'm funny and want to show how bad I am at Pokemon, I put a reset counter in the top left corner. Why? I don't really know. Also, say hello to yours truly. Yes, that is my hair. What hair, I hear you ask? And this is the part where I desire to cry. Oshawott is my starter, and our battle commences with Hugh, or as I named him, Omega. His name is Omega because one of my mods on Twitch is named Omega, and I like to beat his ass. Now, there's a reason why the challenge doesn't begin until after the capture tutorial. Regardless of how many times you reset, it doesn't even matter. The attacks that your rival uses, at least in this game, are predetermined. The first move he uses will always be a tackle attack. Since you cannot avoid this battle whatsoever and training is out of the question until you get past this point, I let it slide, because there is no challenge if we want to be technical, or you know, just an ass who doesn't like fun. You should like fun, and don't be an ass that's good life advice. Predicaments in a no damage run are a dime in a dozen. Right out of the gate, there's already an issue. To safely start knocking out Pokemon with your starter without taking damage, you must get to level 9. Otherwise, it's a coin flip on whether you take damage or not. Complete RNG. I think you know where I'm going with this. To get Oshawa to level 9, I need to run through 6 different Pokemon at level 3 or higher without taking damage. If you do the math on that, every Pokemon up to this point only has 2 moves. 1 offensive and 1 defensive. 2 to the 6th power power is 64, meaning the odds of getting my starter to level 9 without taking damage was 1 in 64. It took some time, just shy of 90 minutes to be exact. That reset counter makes me want to cry. A beneficial factor that flew over my head until someone in my chat pointed out was the EV spread I was obtaining. Purloin gives a speed EV for every knockout, while Batrat gives an attack EV. When you realize that regardless of the moveset, as long as you're upgrading anything besides defense, special defense, or HP, suddenly knocking out all these cats, rats, bats, snats, fats, wait, sorry, Knocking these Pokemon out isn't all that bad. It turns out that a lot of this challenge is just sitting there and knocking out Pokemon for hours and hours on end. It's a never-ending curse, especially since the dreaded XP curve was introduced in Generation 5, and it's bullshit. For anyone that doesn't know, every time you level up your Pokemon, you start earning less XP per knockout, regardless if the opponent is wild or with a trainer. The game intentionally slows your progress down for virtually no reason. Did I mention that it's bullshit? To get past Hugh, <coughs> excuse me, Omega, our dirty rival, I needed to evolve Oshawa and level him up to 25 so that tackle does enough damage to one hit knock out his Snivy. I like pain. If you've seen my other videos, here's one that mentions it explicitly. Go watch it after you finish this one. Sharon's gym was a cakewalk because I already over leveled my starter. Absolutely joyous was me when I clean sweep the most normal of gyms. Checkpoint one, hallelujah. Obviously, for this challenge, I need an entire team because let's face it, trying to solo Pokemon is isn't even hard whatsoever. I could do it with any Pokemon in any game. Trying to do it solo without taking damage is even out of my league, and oh yeah, literally impossible. And there's a reason I specifically chose Black 2 instead of White 2. Down in the Verbank complex, there's a certain fire type that spawns there, and we need it for this challenge. And no, it is not the Growlithe. I love Growlithe and Arcanine, but they are not what we require. Instead, it is Magby. I would love nothing more than to do this in White 2 where Elekid spawns in its place because Electivire is my all-time favorite Pokemon. But the versatility, at least for this run, is inferior to Magmortar. I may have died a little on the inside when I was putting together this team. We're not going to talk about the reset counter by the time I was actually able to capture one of these things, and I didn't even get a good nature for it in the end. This run is going amazing so far. More restless grinding was required so that Queets, that's the name of our Magby by the way, was in tune with Duat. I despise endless grinding. I do nothing unless it has a purpose, however, and Magby did have a purpose in the Poison Gym. For what it's worth, a majority of the gas bags and sludge piles got swallowed up by Duat's water pulse, but Roxy's Whirlipede required a fire type move because it's primary bug type. Magby used Flame Burst to end Roxy's career, all so I can get a badge. Checkpoint 2. Although I don't think anybody is going to blame me if I push the official save beyond the Pokestar Studio shooting sh 
because that takes an ungodly amount of time to get through, and all of it is dialogue I never bothered reading in the first place. I'm not exactly sure if this battle counts as us taking damage. In the moment, I decided that since it wasn't my Pokemon that was on the set, that it didn't officially count, but what do you think? Does this dictate that it's impossible to beat Black and White 2 without taking damage by sheer technicality and loopholes alone? Leave a comment below. By this point, I have a love-hate relationship with catching Pokemon now. On one hand, sweet! Awesome! I get a new Pokemon for the team. It's gonna help out a ton for future battles. Great choice! On the other hand, f*** me. I gotta go grind wild encounters for hours on end off stream. Funny, funny game. Riolu into Lucario has very great potential for becoming a crucial member of the team I need to finish the job, and evolving it using an exploit that I have no shame in admitting to is my strategy for beating everyone up. I need any advantage I can get. Before hitting level 20, 18 to be exact, Lucario was ready to throw fists, take on any opponent in front of him, roll him up into a ball, flip it sideways, and punt for three points on the gridiron. I honestly forgot where exactly I renamed my starter, but his his name is now Yen Pai, as obviously shown by the giant red arrow in the middle of your screen that obviously shows what and where the name is. And he evolved into Samurott as well, so that is incredibly awesome. And I am terrible with sprites on the screen, as this was pre-recorded on a live stream. Initially, I sent out the wrong Pokemon to fight Berg, the third gym leader. I sent out Samurott against his Swadloon when I should have sent out Magby. But it was fine, as I took no damage anyway. Magby quickly took care of Levani with Flame Burst and gave some nice XP. The final Pokemon was Dwebble. Now, Dwebble is an interesting case. The ability this one has is sturdy, and I have no multi-hit moves that are able to finish it off in one shot. Coupled with the fact that its only defensive move is Rock Polish, and you have a recipe for disaster, because as we know, if we take damage, we reset back to the last gym. Let's take a look at what happened. No! <laughs> uh. So that was painful to experience and watch. I was devastated. I put levels into all three of my Pokemon and I had to do it all over again. I hate this challenge. It was hours and hours, but I got everybody back up to par and I told myself that if it didn't happen this time, I was quitting the challenge and coming back to it at a later date. The first two Pokemon were chumps against Magby and then came Dwebble. Let's just show what happened. Either move on or we die here again. I don't think I could take another one. I honest to God don't think so. We got sturdy. Yep. Yes! Ah! <sighs> ah! <sighs> I don't think I could have taken another reset, man. My relief was immeasurable and my day was made. Even more so now that Magby evolved into Magmar. That right there is my most satisfying checkpoint of this entire challenge. Also, Magmar's animated sprite looks like he's trying to get the attention of somebody. It looks like he's saying, hey, look at me, I'm over here. The next gym leader ahead of us is Elisa, the electric type gym leader. And she's a rather peculiar problem because of not just one, but two of her Pokemon. Both her Amalga and Zipstrika have quick attack, a plus one priority move. Emolga is a flying type that has static as its ability, while Zipstrika's base speed is 116, one of the fastest in the entire game. Both of these combined create a rather interesting puzzle that we need to solve, so I took to the internet and looked through the various Pokemon that are able to be captured thus far and which ones have priority moves. Even my own starter has a priority move right now, but it does not KO Zipstrika until level 65, so that was out of the question with the XP curve. Ultimately, there was only a single choice to use for the upcoming gym battle, and that was Lipard. Let me explain. Sucker Punch is the highest damaging plus priority move in Black and White 2. Unfortunately, it's physical, only hits if the opponent is actively using an offensive move, and only has 5 PP. And Perline doesn't learn it until level 46, which makes it the last move it can possibly learn via level up. It's not completely foolproof, unfortunately, because Amolga's static can screw everything up, but I just have to take that chance. It seems to be a recurring shtick that we have to rely on RNG, wouldn't you say? Color me surprised when the very first one I captured gave me naughty nature, the best possible nature I could ask for, and it was on to grinding. Yes, I'm using the XP share because living in monotony is not on the agenda. I'm sorry, Autono population. I became the sole reason as to why they're an endangered species. Once I got Purloin to a comfortable level, I shifted back to Route 19 to garner attack and speed EV, so I'm living in monotony anyway. F 
me, man. I ended up using a spare rare candy just to get that last level in because I wanted to be lazy for once in this challenge, and it is now a Lightbird. Said Lightbird knocked out each of the trainers on the runway to Elisa with Sucker Punch only, and I have no shame in admitting that I ran out to heal at the Pokemon Center multiple times thanks to Static. Still took no damage though. Right before this battle, I happened to look through my item bag and saw I had a wide lens which boosts the accuracy of moves. Lucario has Bone Rush right now, which can be a great ground type move that's only held back by 90 accuracy. The wide lens fixes that problem. This is important for later. All that preparation for Elisa and now it was time to battle. Emolga was first and the issue here isn't that I can't knock it out, it's whether or not she'll induce paralysis, which is something we cannot avoid whatsoever. RNG was not on my side once again, that's the story of my life, and static took effect. Lucario was sent out to deal with Flaffy with Bone Rush, I told you Wide Lens is amazing. And now it was time for Zeb Strika. There wasn't any turning back here, we just simply had to go for it. I used Sucker Punch praying that one, Zeb Strika does not use Quick Attack, two, that it actually hits. So many factors went into this one move and I managed to knock Elisa out 100% without taking damage. Mystic the Lightbird is officially goaded, checkpoint is mine, I love this challenge. Soon after I ran into this guy, and he gave me a Zoroa. I don't need a Zoroa, so I boxed it for all eternity. There is only one Pokemon to capture at this point in time, and that Pokemon is Drillbur. Drillbur knows Earthquake, that should say enough, and if it doesn't, well then you're just a dirty, filthy casual. Here is Earthquake's stats. Here is what Earthquake is good against. Wait, not that type, sorry. I rest my case. Knocking out Audino is both quick, painless, and efficient for my team. And Drillbur lived a short life before evolving into Excadrill. Even going into the gym, I am still terrible with replacing sprites. This gym is a ground type gym, so I pay half attention and let Samurott sweep the entire thing with Water Pulse and the occasional Aqua Jet. I have no idea what I was doing right here, but it's kind of funny, so I'm letting you all enjoy my obnoxiousness. It's absolutely ridiculous but who cares, right? What I do care about is that sweet, sweet checkpoint. I hardly cover why I have to reset, but this was just upsetting and makes me want to cry looking back at it. It did come from Heartbreaker Charles, so at least the name checks out. The Pokemon World Tournament. I hate this place. Well, it's more or less a love-hate relationship. I love it because we can face every single prominent trainer from previous games except Koga for some reason. I hate it because it made me reset. To go damageless is essentially a gauntlet with one HP. You cannot switch in between battles and there are many different Pokemon you fight. Initially, I chose Lightbird because Sucker Punch is incredible with stab and priority. It did not work against Colress's Magneton, so it was back to the old drawing board. Because our Excadrill has Earthquake and Earthquake is an SSS tier move, I swept everyone besides, of course, the f Magneton, who just happened to have Sturdy. And for some reason, I didn't even take that into account. It didn't matter though, because I managed to bullshit my way out of it with an incredible dodge against a mirror shot, 85 accuracy. I love this challenge immensely. Zubat was captured not too long after that, I really need to stop tempting RNG. So, Skarmory. It sucks. And you want to know why? Because it's a steel type that can fly and has Sturdy as its ability. My old nemesis Sturdy, welcome back, I still hate your guts. Only this time, I can't rely on the Mon I built around countering Sturdy because, as you know, steel resists dark. F*** me, man. So we're back to the Elisa situation, only twice as bad. So here we are once again, back to the damage calculator. I'm 97% sure I spent more time calculating damage outputs than actual time playing through the game at this point. I start digging now. I'm taking type charts, move sets, and a list of Pokemon and twisting them backwards, sideways, upside down, and diagonal, trying desperately to find something that can deal with Skarmory because none of my current team is equipped to do so. I spent 45 minutes looking through Pokemon after Pokemon, even even settling on Mien Xiao before I discovered I couldn't even capture it until after the gym battle. I hate this challenge immensely. To make a long story short, I found Axew. Axew, and by proxy Haxorus, has the ability Mold Breaker. The only problem is that Axew's capture rate is very low at 45, which equates to roughly 12% base. Even maximizing my odds there, it's only a 1 in 3 chance. These aren't normal circumstances, so to prevent myself from losing levels on every member of my team and Crobat overall, I I throw the master ball. Axew desperately needed some work, so I threw EVs into attack, special attack, and speed, and leveled her up to 65 in preparation for the gym battle. I also gave her surf as well and took to the gym. Rock slide with wide lands combo is still kicking ass, as both Swoobat and Swana fell to good old Bojangles. Hours and hours of grinding up a brand new Pokemon finally come to fruition in one simple fight. Haxorus uses surf on Skarmory, the Mold Breaker nullifying sturdy, and I win the badge. Keep the Pokemon and take my next checkpoint. 
point. Thank you, Skyla. You caused me great grief, but you're still my favorite. Progressing through the game is like bashing my head into a wall over and over again. The next wall in front of me is a double battle with a Plasma Grunt and Zinzolan. Two of these Pokemon consists of Cryogonal and Golbat, which are immune to ground type attacks. And it's a double battle. Did I mention it's a double battle? It required me to level up Magmar 13 times to level 72, and this fool Omega still has Pokemon in the lower 40s. How does he expect to get his sister's Purloin back if he's this far behind me? At any rate, I'll be the one saving the Purloin. Drayden's gym was approaching fast, and I'm already prepared for every single Pokemon in there. So much so that I end up doing every single battle available in the gym. I'm not kidding. You're only required to battle four times. I knocked out all six trainers in the gym, no problem. Haxor has dominated every opponent, and it's starting to develop an undefeated streak. Whether I need a Dragon Claw or Dragon Pulse, it didn't matter. Drayden stood zero chance against my beast checkpoint. I now see why Omega is so hell-bent on getting his sister's purloin back. Zinzolin, this piece of sh once again sets up another wall preventing me from going forward thanks to his Weavile. And the only way past him is leveling up Liper to 77 so that the 1-2 combo of Fake Out and Sucker Punch obliterates the darkest ice type, all because of Ice Shard. It's crap. It's what it, it was what it was. Oh my god, you're kidding me. Really? Really? I did all that prep to get a critical hit with a fake out? Honest to God, f*** this game. Humalao City Gym was immediately after, and because Lucario has not gotten much love up to this point, I let him wreck everyone and leave. I should point out that this is the last checkpoint until the very end of the game, so to future-proof needless grinding, I made sure to level every member of my team anywhere from the low to mid-70s range. It's called paranoia, don't judge me. Marlin was quite simple, his Caracosta has Sturdy, what a surprise. Haxorus' superpower took care of it, while Lypert, in true fashion, proves once again why she is the greatest member of my team, I'm very sorry, Excadrill. The final checkpoint of the challenge is mine, please do not say anything about my reset count, I don't want to talk about it. I had a bit of a scare when this double battle presented itself with Omega. I mean, it's Omega as my partner here. Of course, I'm scared regardless who the opponent is. Although I suppose choosing Oshawott had a great long-term effect as Grass is weak to poison, so the survivor here went after Superior while I was the useful one and actually knocked out Pokemon. Omega really needs to get his sh together. There is something wrong here. Can you guess what it is? I'm gonna give you 10 seconds to figure it out. No, I won't. Magmar is still a Magmar. And up to this point, a Magmarizer was unavailable to help it evolve until now. And because trade evolutions are non-existent at this point in time, and frankly, I think they're bullshit anyway, I turned that feature off so that I only have to level Magmar up while holding his precious item for it to evolve, like a normal Pokemon. He was the first capture and the last to evolve. Makes me want to cry. The Rocket Grunts the Rocket Grunts, wow, I've been playing too much Go. The Plasma Grunts were all pushovers. The only good they did was make it slightly easier for me to win this challenge. Of course, we had to find this guy. Again, f***ing Zinzolin for the third time. Only this time, it's a double battle with Omega. And he still has Weavile. And it still has Ice Shard. I should just quit while I'm ahead. I gave it a shot though with Excadrill and surprisingly it worked out in my favor. Rock Slide one hit KO'd every Pokemon on the opposing side and Weavile used Ice Shard on the superior, resulting in me winning the fight. I love this challenge. Cross that, I hate this challenge because I have to fight him again like 30 minutes later. I forgot to switch panels, but the gameplay is still on the screen. It's ritz and repeat with this guy. I think I fight this fool more than Omega, and that's boring. I'm sorry, y'all. I really tried to make Zinzola somewhat interesting, and I failed miserably. Please forgive me. Afterwards, Colrest disappointed me by only bringing five Pokemon to the battle with him. To this point, there had been not one trainer that has had a full team with them. I don't understand when I played Black 2 over a decade ago, I had a full team within 20 minutes of getting my starter. It's so simple. You just beat everybody up and take their money. That's what I did with Chorus anyway. I overpowered with superpower and set everything else on fire. It's actually pretty easy now. Same with the Shadow Triad. You just set everything on fire and send out Lyperd when you don't want to take damage. It's so simple. And then here's Omega just standing there being useless, looking at his sister's purloin. Yes, that is a purloin. Poor Getz has finally makes his appearance. I will say he's 
probably the most evil villain Pokemon's ever had, considering it's implied that he's willing to beat a child to death with his bare hands in Ultra Sun and Moon. I wish I was kidding. That being said, his entire plan for using Curum Black to fulfill his desire has only one tiny flaw to it. He didn't account for a player-controlled protagonist. He should have leveled it up more. Getsus does have one redeeming factor, however, and that is the fact that he actually has a full team of Pokemon on him. How cute. There wasn't an opportunity to switch out my Pokemon, so I was stuck with Haxorus going into the battle. Under normal circumstances, at that level, Haxorus could not one-hit knock out the Cofagrigus. Giving her a Dragon Gym, however, boosts her Dragon Power, and the Claw is mightier. The rest of his team, well, uh, they were trash. I was more scared of the Purloin and Petrat on Route 19. This is the part where I'm supposed to care about Omega and I's last fight, but I honestly can't because he's a bad trainer who couldn't even fulfill his own goal. I had to do that for him. I could act like he was a challenge, or I could tell the truth. Which do you want? The final obstacle separating myself from greatness, the elite foreign champion. They're supposedly the toughest trainers in the entire region. I call bullshit on that. Why? Because none of their Pokemon surpassed level 60. Here's the breakdown of what happened. I wanted to give each of the members on my team some love, so that's what I did. For Chantal, I had Lucario unleash Dark Pulse on Cofagrigus and Drifblim, while Samurott took care of Chandelure and I had Excadrill Shadow Claw the Golurk because why not? For Grimsley, I had to start out with Lyper to use Fake Out on his Lyper and finish the job with Night Slash. Lucario Aurasphered the Bisharp, Samurott surfed the Crocodile, and I had Haxorus Superpower the Scrafty. For Caitlyn, Lyper was sent out again to use Night Slash on Musharna and Reuniclus, Samurott to Ice Beam the Sigilyph, and Lucario to Dark Purse the Gothitelle. For Marshall, God bless this dude because I finally had the opportunity to use Crobat in a vital battle effectively. I used him here and there against some of the many trainers you stumble across, but never in a crucial manner until now. Crobat took care of Throw, Conkelder, and Mian Shao, while I had to use Haxorus for Sock because sturdy Pokemon will just not off already. One last wall in the form of Iris, the champion. Hydreigon is her first Pokemon, so I send out Samurott to Ice Beam that, Arceus, and Drudigan. Bonus points because my own saliva right here is trying to kill me. That was a fun time. Haxorus took care of the other half, first by using Dragon Claw against Lapras and Superpower against the Aggron. Now here is the scariest moment of the entire playthrough. Iris' very last Pokemon, a Haxorus no less, is holding a Focus Sash. A Focus Sash is a held item that prevents a Pokemon from getting knocked out in one hit. It has no counters to it whatsoever as far as I know, meaning that on the very last Pokemon to beat for this challenge, we have to rely on RNG to win. One of Haxorus' moves is Dragon Dance, the other three are offensive, meaning there's a 25% chance not to take damage, and it happened. The opposing Haxorus used Dragon Dance, which prevented any damage this turn. I used Dragon Claw to knock it out, and I was crowned champion, and I beat Pokemon Black and White 2 without taking damage. If you enjoyed this video or learned something, consider leaving it a like. Or if you didn't learn anything or didn't enjoy it, leave it a dislike. And if you haven't already, and you like what you see on your channel, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I would greatly appreciate it. It's free, and you can always change your mind if you want. Have a good one. Peace out.